invite you to take your Bibles once more and turn to the Old Testament to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 23. As we turn to this passage to hear it, I remind you that this is among those scriptures that is breathed out by God. Indeed, Paul tells us that all scripture is breathed out for God, by, breathed out by God. And therefore, it is profitable to us. It is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. This is the Word of God. Let us give our attention to its reading. No one whose testicles are crushed or whose male organ is cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. No one born of a forbidden union may enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of his descendants may enter the assembly of the Lord. No Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation, none of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and with water on the way when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam the son of Beor from Pethor of Mesopotamia to curse you. But the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam. Instead, the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loved you. You shall not seek their peace or their prosperity all your days forever. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian because you were a sojourner in his land. Children born to them in the third generation may enter the assembly of the Lord. When you are encamped against your enemies, then you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. If any man amongst, among you becomes unclean because of a nocturnal emission, then he shall go outside the camp. He shall not come inside the camp. But when evening comes, he shall bathe himself in water. And as the sun sets, he may come inside the camp. You shall have a place outside the camp, and you shall go out to it. And you shall have a trowel with your tools. And when you sit down outside, you shall dig a hole with it, and turn back and cover up your excrement. Because the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp, to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore your camp must be holy, so that he may not see anything indecent among you, and turn away from you. Rest with us. And the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, as we continue together our study of Deuteronomy, I want to remind you of its structure. Remember the first four chapters deal with the history of the people, how it is that they come to the Jordan River, ready to cross over and to enter into the promised land. Beginning in chapter 5, we read the law of God given a second time. And from that point, after chapter 5, Moses has been expounding the law of God. He has been explaining what it means, uh, a commandment by commandment, for the Israelites when they come into the promised land. And as we have worked our way through this, we have noted that the commandments both forbid certain things, as well as command certain things. And that's where the structure of our catechism comes from. The things that are forbidden by each commandment the things that are commanded by each one. For instance, the, we saw the prohibition against murder spoke also to the protection of life. And we began last time, two weeks ago, with the seventh commandment, that commandment that forbids adultery. We talk at length about how the ground of this command is God's faithfulness. And so Israel is called to be faithful we noted there that there were different ways in which they were called to be faithful. They were called to be faithful neighbors. They were called to be faithful rulers over creation. And they were also called to faithfulness within their marital relationships. Well, these 14 verses from Deuteronomy 23 might not seem at first glance as though they have anything to do with the seventh commandment. They would even guess that many of you, most of you, have not heard a sermon on these verses. Indeed, I imagine that some of you who have read through the entire Bible are trying to figure out right now 
how you missed these verses. But they're there. And they're given for us that we might be instructed, that we might be encouraged. And so remember what we talked about last time. Israel is not just the people of God, but they are envisioned as the bride of God. And marriage, the fidelity between husband and wife, is imaged as God and His people and their faithfulness to one another. Now we know, of course, that God is the only faithful one. We know that we are not. We know that Paul's words, that if we are faithless, He remains faithful. That these words are crucial to us. But here we see the call to Israel to be faithful. To be faithful and to, and to be pure. To be pure as they, as they are those among whom God would dwell. You see, that's what this chapter or these verses are about. God's presence with his people. And this is where the rub comes. Because these verses make perfectly clear that God excludes some people. Now we're going to talk about what the exclusions are and why and think about that. But the very beginning is that God excludes some when we live in a, in, a, in a society that is hyper-inclusive, to exclude anyone for virtually any reason is considered mean, cruel. And indeed, passages like this, along with a whole host of others in the Old Testament, are the reason why one, one modern preacher has said that we must unhitch our faith from the Old Testament. The Old Testament, some believe, is dangerous. Well, as I said, it's easy to point the finger outside of the church. But the reality is that this text probably shocks you as well. Especially as you consider some of the reasons why people are excluded from God's presence here in these verses. But I want us to remember that God has always been exclusive. Right? Remember that in the Garden of Eden, God commanded Adam and Eve to obey His voice. And if they did not, what would happen? They would be excluded. They would be kicked out of Eden, no longer able to dwell in the presence of the Lord. We think of Noah and his family there on the ark. Everybody else excluded. Abraham and his offspring. Israel, the church. Remember Paul's words in Romans 9, echoing what is written in Exodus. I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. You see, this passage before us is about exclusion. And maybe we can settle it this way. We can talk about it this way. It's about boundaries. Setting the boundaries for who will be in God's presence. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? We heard in our call to worship. We also sang in Psalm 15. And under the old covenant, what we must understand is physical wholeness was meant to point to spiritual wholeness. That's the picture before us today. The physical representing the call to spiritual wholeness. Leviticus 22, verse 22, we read animals blind or disabled or mutilated or having a discharge or an itch or scabs, you shall not offer to the Lord or give them to the Lord as a food offering on the altar. Why? Because they are not whole. Because they are not perfect. And so this text serves to remind us it is only those who are whole and those who are holy who are able to come in the presence of God. And that, by the way, is where the tension will come in, and we'll need to think about how it is that God brings this passage to pass in the New Testament. Let's begin our study of our text together. We see, first of all, the call to purity, and it comes through exclusion. Who is not allowed in the presence of God? And it begins with, on the basis of defect. It begins on the basis of defect. Now again, this is echoing what Scripture says elsewhere. In Leviticus 21 and verse 17, we read, speak to Aaron saying, none of your offspring throughout their generations who has a blemish may approach to offer the bread of his God. Not only would the, would the sacrifice itself need to be whole, so also the priest 
who would come into the presence of God must be whole. And that's what we see here in verse 1. Now, we want to press further, though, to understand what exactly is going on here. Why is this such an affront that they are kept out of the presence of God on the basis of cutting or crushing? Now, first, we want to note that it is actually the assembly of the Lord that is echoed throughout this section of Deuteronomy 23. It refers to that gathering of God's people as a community, oftentimes during festival occasions or other times of public worship. Now, some believe that it has to do with the importance of seed, the promise of descendants. And by the way, that would make sense, right? In Genesis chapter 3, God says to, to Adam and to Eve, the seed of the woman, or says to the serpent, the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent. And so there must be those descendants, that seed. Or we can think about the promise to Abraham, that it's through Abraham's descendants that the blessings would come upon all the families of the earth. So maybe it's just simply the point that those who would serve before God must be able to procreate. Now, I'm not convinced by that. Now, some hold that, and so I put that out there. Others believe that it has to do with the pagan and the idolatrous worship of the nations in the promised land around Israel. And in fact, when you look into them, there were actual pagan festivals that took place that included emasculation exactly along the lines that is spoken of here in Deuteronomy 23. So perhaps that's getting us a bit closer. But on the whole, I think that it has to do with what we've already talked about. Wholeness, perfection. The physical is pointing to what is true spiritually. No defect may come into God's presence. He is a God who is holy, righteous, Indeed, any defect is the result of sin in the world. And therefore, it is not able to come into the presence of God. And here it was given very clearly in the Old Testament through very clear restrictions of who could minister before the Lord. Before we bring that story to its fulfillment, let's press on in our text. Because it not only talks about those who are excluded through on the basis of defect, but also on the basis of birth. And here we see two things that are talked about. The first is a forbidden union in verse 2. And the second are the Ammonites and the Moabites. And so first, the forbidden union. Again, they're not able to enter what? The assembly of the Lord. Even to the tenth generation of tenth uh, it's, it's most likely referring to kind of fullness. And so it has, and it's echoed when it talks about the Ammonite and the Moabite, forever. It is saying that they are forbidden from coming to that corporate public gathering of worship and taking part in it forever. Now the word used here only occurs one other time in the Old Testament. And it's used to describe children of mixed marriages or even of incest in Zechariah 9 in verse 6. It is likely a summary then, a summary description of the various kinds of unions that are forbidden in Leviticus chapter 18. Remember, those who would hear Deuteronomy would have Genesis all the way through numbers available to them. And so Deuteronomy is a summarizing of everything that has been said earlier. And so those of a forbidden union, are, or those children of forbidden union, are not permitted into the assembly of the Lord. Now, by the way, we actually saw something of this earlier in Deuteronomy 7. We looked at this last week for a second time, where we read, you shall not intermarry with them, that is, those within the land, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons, for they would turn away your sons from following me to serve other gods. The reality is that God cares about the children of his people. This is one of the key purposes for the Seventh Commandment. Mixed parentage, remember, wasn't about ethnicity. It was about faith. But then it presses on. Not only those of a forbidden union are, 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 are kept from entering, but also no Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of the Lord. 
Again, even to the tenth generation, none of them may enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Now, of course, you probably know off the top of your head where the Ammonites and the Moabites come from. You know that their beginnings go against actually the previous verse about forbidden unions. It was Lot and his daughters in Genesis 19 who produce Ammon and Moab. It is from them that the Ammonites and the Moabites come. But interestingly, that's not why they're listed as restrictive here, is it? Instead, God shows the relationship between the nations and Israel through the wilderness. And he lists two reasons, right? One is that they did not uh, meet you with bread and with water on the way when you came out of Egypt. And as a matter of fact, they, they forbade them. They did not want anything to do with them. But the second one is also memorable. It's found in, in the book of Numbers, and it has to do with Balaam. Remember Balaam? Balak, the king, he sought to hire Balaam to curse Israel. As a matter of fact, I think we can see the principle in operation here is what we read in Genesis chapter 12. In Genesis 12, God calls Abraham to follow after him. And remember the promises that God gives to Abraham. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. He even tells them that in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. But right there in that promise are these words. I will bless those who bless you and him who curses you, I will curse. You see, clearly, when the king of Moab, when the Ammonites not only did not bless the people of God, but specifically sought to curse them, they incurred the curse of God. The exact words in Numbers 22 that were used by Balak, the son of Zippor, to Balaam is, Come, curse this people for me. Now remember, as, as God says here in Deuteronomy 23, He does not permit the curse, but instead blesses Israel by the mouth of Balaam. But Balak desired a curse. He indeed, he himself, had cursed Israel. And so God curses the Ammonites. God curses the Moabites. And look at the extent to which he curses. You shall not seek their peace or their prosperity all your days forever. This strikes us as harsh. It's a blanket rejection of the Ammonites and the Moabites. That as Ammonites and as Moabites, they are not to be allowed among the people of God. Remember that God will have mercy on whom he has mercy. But remember also, this is not everything that's said in scripture about the Moabites or about the Ammonites. The reality is that they could not be among the people of God as Moabites, as Ammonites. We know that there were those who were called out of those countries, out of those peoples, and who united themselves to Israel. And they not only received the blessing, they not only received prosperity, but they were even in the lineage of Jesus Christ. Ruth is a Moabitess. And when Solomon has his son Rehoboam, we read in 1 Kings 14 that his mother's name was Naaman. The Ammonite. So we already begin to see in the Old Testament, not cracks in Deuteronomy 23, but rather the way in which God will bring blessing even to those who are outside of the covenant promises. And this is important. This is important because we, in ourselves, we don't belong in the covenant. We are those who were once far off, who have been brought near. How? Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Well, as always, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, let's look at our second point. It'll go a bit quicker than the first. We see first the purity through exclusion, but now purity through inclusion. And these ones might be a little bit surprising. The Edomite, the Egyptian. Let's take those in turn. 
the Edomites are said that they are able to come into the assembly of the Lord in the third generation. The grandchildren, we would say. They are, they are able to come into the, into the assembly of the Lord. But remember, those of you who know your Old Testament history, you know that the Edomites also refused to bring bread and water to the Israelites. In fact, the Edomites were so refusing that they said, we will go to war with you over it. And they sent their army out. And yet Israel is told that they may not abhor the Edomites. They may not abhor the Egyptians. Now this word abhor, it, it, it's a Hebrew word that's used primarily of rejecting something unclean from a ritual or a ceremonial point of view. And so on the one hand, we could say that the Ammonites, the Moabites, and the, un, the, the forbidden unions, that they were to be kept out on the basis of that uncleanness. But that the Edomites and the Egyptians, not falling into that category, were able eventually to come in. But interestingly, I think it's, it's likely rooted, at least for the Edomites, in the fact that Jacob and Esau were brothers. He says what we see right there, right? You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. Reminding, of course, of the close relationship, the connection that was there between Israel and between Edom. But why would they not abhor the Egyptians? He says, because you were a sojourner in his land. What's interesting about this is that God looks not to not, not, not to the time when Israel was in slavery in Egypt, but rather to the time they were sojourners in Egypt. You see, this one might be the most surprising of all. Egypt had enslaved Israel. They would killed their male, their male children, forced them to make bricks without straw. But it's actually looking further back than that. Is looking back to that time when Pharaoh invited Joseph's father and his brothers and their households into the land of Egypt and gave them the best of the land and provided for them during the famine. And so we see that there's going to be purity through exclusion, but also purity through inclusion. Israel is not going to be allowed to keep out people they want to keep out. It's up to God who draws near to him. It's up to the Lord. Now this should make sense to Israel already because it's not like there's anything that they have done that brings them into the presence of God. Remember, we read in Deuteronomy 7, it's not because you are more numerous, it's not because you are the greatest, but it's because the Lord, what? Set his love on you. Salvation is all of God. Those who would draw near to him are those who he calls to himself. And so we see the purity through exclusion. The purity through inclusion. Lastly, in our last category, the purity in battle. Verse 9, when you are encamped against your enemies, then you shall keep yourself from every evil thing. Now in one sense, this, the scene shifts here. Before it was the assembly of the Lord, implying the corporate gathering for worship. And here it moves to the battlefield. But in another sense, it's the same issue. That's that question. Who shall come into the presence of the Lord? You see, all of this that we're looking at in, these, in this next section is grounded in the last verse, in verse 14. It is the Lord who is in your midst. Why must they keep the camp pure? Why must they, why must they avoid all of the things? We're going to look at those one by one in a moment. It's because God is in their presence. The Lord is in their midst. And this underscores what we've already seen and we've already noted about Israel as an army. They were not a common nation. They are a holy nation. Therefore, their army was a holy army. They waged holy war with the help of the Lord. And ever since the close of the Old Covenant, there is no longer any one nation that belongs to God in this way. But rather, the Lord makes his covenant with the church from all nations. Well, the initial command has to do with the spiritual dangers and the temptations that Israel would face. You shall keep yourself from every evil thing. 
Now again, that strikes us as, as, as amazing. An army, an army that would go out to battle. Everything we know about armies, especially in our own day, it, it, it does not strike into our minds that they are going to keep themselves from every evil thing. But that was Israel's command. When we can think of those, those dangers on an individual basis or at a corporate level, they were to keep themselves from idolatry, from disobeying the Lord, from misusing God's gifts for waging war wrongly. They were to keep themselves from all of that. You see, this is what Israel will be judged against as an army. If you want to read about that, you can read in Joshua 6 and 7 about how God gave very specific instructions and Israel disobeyed. And so God turned his wrath against them. Though he had destroyed Jericho at, with just a shout and a trumpet blow, not a single sword drawn, no army tactics, the Lord was the one who fought for them when they went against Achan, or when they went, went against Ai, because Achan had stolen the things that were dedicated to the Lord. He did not keep himself from every evil thing. God's wrath and judgment fell upon Israel. And they lost. And so we see the call to purity. And then it goes on and it gives a couple of examples beyond what I've already talked about. You see, it goes on and it talks about two very specific kinds of purity. The one is ceremonial. And we can say the other is natural. In other words, I, let me put it this way. It's talking about two different kinds of pollution. One is ceremonial and one is natural. You see, that's what's going on here in these verses. In verse 10, as it speaks about the nocturnal emission, the uncleanness here is not fundamentally physical in nature, but it's ritual. It has to do with Israel's function as the army of the Lord. And in order to, to underscore this, listen to some other passages. In Leviticus 15 and verse 16, we read, If a man has an emission of semen, he shall bathe his whole body in water and be unclean until the evening. Now, in order to really kind of understand what's going on here, we have to bring to mind a passage that maybe you're aware of, maybe not. If you've been in the congregation for any period of time, you've heard him talk about Leviticus chapter 10. Remember Leviticus 10, it's where Nadab and Abihu offer up strange fire to the Lord, and God consumes them in his anger, in his wrath. But there at the end of that passage, God gives very specific instructions. He says, you are to distinguish between the holy and the common, and between the unclean and the clean. Those are the categories that Israel is to look at all things, and that by which they're going to base all things. Things are either holy or common. They are either clean or unclean. The unclean things mean that they cannot come in the presence of the Lord. And so here we see in Leviticus 15, Deuteronomy 23, also Numbers chapter 5, if you want to read that later, that there are things that would disqualify someone from being in the presence of the Lord for that day. In Leviticus 15, it was actually the camp. It was where the tabernacle would be and the people encamped around it. So they had to go outside of the camp and wait till evening and bathe and come back in. It didn't change when they went to battle. Why? Because God went with them. And so they themselves were called to be clean during that time. But they were also to distinguish between the holy and the common. And let's face it, it doesn't get much more common than going to the bathroom. And that's exactly what we see in verses 12 and 13. 12 and 13, we could say, perhaps, we're just a matter of hygiene. I mean, after all, you have an army. You have companies, whether hundreds or thousands. And they're going out to battle, and they're going to need to relieve themselves. They did not bring porta potties with them. They did not have indoor plumbing and things like that to, to utilize. And so they were given instructions. It was something common, and so they were to go out of the camp because the camp was holy. Now I'm stressing this because this is, this is how we want to understand what exactly is going on here. You see, if it's just basic hygiene, then we might, we, we might be afraid of using the bathroom. We might think that that's somehow, you know, off limits. Like no praying during the bathroom. That's not what it's getting at. It is saying very clearly 
the distinguish, distinction between the holy and the common is to be held. And so here we have the call to purity, the examples of purity, and the reason. And I've talked about this already, but let me just say a little bit more. Verse 14, because the Lord your God walks in the midst of your camp. Now that's very specific. It is the Lord who walks among them. That just as God would walk in the garden with Adam and Eve in Genesis, just as Noah walked with God, just as God spoke to Abram and said, walk before me and be blameless, God walks in the midst of his people. He walks in the midst of their camp. He says to deliver you and to give up your enemies before you. Therefore, your camp must be holy. And so anything common must be kept out. Anything unclean must be washed. And that's what's going on in this passage. And by the way, this connects it then to the story, the bigger story of Scripture. And by the way, any time you come across a passage in Scripture that makes you shocked, that makes you even a little uncomfortable, try to step back and to see it as part of a bigger narrative, a bigger story. Because first of all, it is. And second of all, you'll often find a way to actually understand the passage better. You see, the bigger story is that God desires to be in the midst of his people. He desires to be in the midst of the people who are whole and who are holy. But the reality is, sin has gotten in the way. In the entrance of sin, we have seen nothing but death, brokenness, unholiness. We are not a people who in ourselves are whole and holy. But that's what these verses are talking about. You see, God excluded certain people, certain classes from his presence. But the question comes, would this remain forever? Are those with defects still excluded from his presence? What of those who are born of mixed races or those who are outside the people of Israel? The New Testament speaks directly to these questions. When we turn to the New Testament, we don't find God simply throwing out these Old Testament separation laws. There are still boundaries, we would say. The promise of God's glorious presence belongs to those who are in Christ. He is the boundary. Listen to the Apostle Paul's words in, chapter, in Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 13. He says, that, he says, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision which is made in the flesh by hands, remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near. How? By the blood of Christ. You see, Jesus is the boundary he is the one who builds the temple of the Lord and fills it with his presence by his Holy Spirit. He is the one who purifies. You see, in order to be in God's presence, we still must be perfectly whole as well as perfectly holy. And that's what Jesus does. He makes us whole. He makes us holy. And by the way, this, this makes perfect sense when you think about Jesus' life on earth. For what did he do? He went about healing people. You see, if we just think about it from the perspective of the people, if we just think about it from looking forward and the desire that so many have that that healing ministry would continue, we might miss the fact that actually Jesus was doing what was necessary for people to be, to be, to be whole and acceptable before God. He was not only dying on the cross for their sins, but he was making them physically whole so that they could come into the presence of God. This is the purpose of his earthly healing ministry. And those who were physically disabled were made whole. And all who, through, who are sinful through his life, death, and resurrection are made holy. This, by the way, is the promise of the Old Testament in the, in, in the book of Isaiah. It comes to fulfillment 
in the New Testament, in Jesus' life. And there are, there are some wonderful passages that we can think about to look at there. I'd encourage you to read Isaiah 35 as well as Isaiah 56. Both speak about, uh, though, about, about, about being made whole and holy before God. Both speak actually in Isaiah 56. It talks about the foreigner as well as the eunuch. You see, this, this passage in Deuteronomy isn't one that we should just dismiss because it has some uncomfortable things that are written in it. Because maybe you've not heard a sermon on it. The reality is, it's pointing us to the work of Jesus Christ who makes us whole and who makes us holy. And we know this is true. And I encourage you to read this later in the day. Because in Acts chapter 8, we encounter someone who is brought into the covenant people of God, who is brought near through Christ, and it's none other than the Ethiopian eunuch. One who would have been excluded in the old covenant because he was not whole, as well as not being holy, is, is in Christ, is whole, and is holy, and is able to draw near to the Lord, is able to worship God, who is baptized there by Philip. And he goes away praising the Lord. He becomes one of those priests of God, right? All believers are priests of God, able to draw near. See, Deuteronomy 23 reminds us of the need, the call to be whole and holy. But the answer to that call isn't to try to keep everything together and to do everything perfectly in yourself, but it's to look to the one who makes you whole, who makes you holy. It's to look to Jesus Christ.